Okay, so um, I sent in kind of just ad hoc for the call papers and it replied that you're in. So I hadn't actually decided what I was going to do and I just threw a random, bunch of random stuff up there and didn't really think it all through. But this is essentially going to be a bunch of just random script dumps, programs, applications. Um, my name is Robert Curdy. I uh, work for an accounting firm, big accounting firm. It's not really important. But uh, do somewhat pen testing, vulnerability assessments, and then just toying around with anything from electronics to mostly computers and apparently uh, Kerbal Space Program for the past 20 hours. And if there's any lacking of spell checks or anything like that, it's directly the result of the Kerbal Space Program. So, command line foo. Uh, again, disclaimer, I'm not a programmer, probably doing it wrong. And these scripts are horribly written and will also include vocats for, for people to look at because this is very boring. Uh, first question is, I got some random stuff up here, got a P3 processor and some crappy Netgear routers and a PIX and a little chumby. But what I'm going to do is ask a question, whoever answers it kind of first, sort of, will get uh, to pick some random garbage. First one is, what's the name of the cartoon on this side? Hong Kong Fooey. Yep, come and grab whatever she said. Yeah, tell me, it's actually got the Zerks, whatever patch on it. Um, and I got information if you wanted to. Yeah, of course it has power. I mean, this also has power too, works great. Hard drive's awesome. I actually wiped it, so it's good to go. Um, the second question is, what is this little flash animation here? Yeah, I didn't see any hands, <laughs> but I saw his mouth move, so I'll grab something. Get the pig. Get it Except this laptop. You can't have, can't have this one. This is not actually my laptop. <laughs> yeah. Factory sealed. It's got free thousand hours or some shit. Is it a tin can or is it a paper? No, no, it's, it's not a tin can. So, here we go. Some options, off the cuff options for kind of scripting and easy embedded or without having any kind of other applications. We can do WMIC in Windows, which is a unique set of all kinds of cool things you could do. You can actually execute things, you can pull back information, you can store things. There's all kinds of fun stuff to do with WMIC. We have, of course, bad files from back in the day and today. VB script and Siglin is, of course, not available natively, but um, you can do some fairly small portable applications with Siglin, just that main Siglin DLL. Um, who here is familiar with Siglin? Has used it before? Or Siglin, or however the hell you pronounce it. But uh, I tried to actually made a, make that portable and virtualize it, but it's like you're virtualizing a virtualization platform, and it doesn't like that very much. Anyways, we got macros, which is like auto IT script and auto hotkey, which if you're doing the same thing over and over again, it's a visual. You can do things like identify windows and find buttons within text. Um, I have a mass uninstaller that will basically whitelist anything in an application and uninstall anything that's not within the whitelist. Um, PowerShell, now I haven't messed with PowerShell because I'm old, so I do everything else in some kind of language. Got Linux, Bash, of course. This is how I do everything in Linux. It's, it's great. So you got Bash, Arc, Sed, which is, you know, curl, and then PHP within curl sometimes for interactive web pages, things like that. And here recently I've been playing with uh, Linux Deploy, and there's a couple of other solutions for um, embedded images, for mounting images. And what you need for that is uh, to be able to mount loop, which is pop within the kernel. Um, and then you also need root, of course. And BusyBox is basically a binary that lets you call other things. So it's like one binary that has a link to, you know, like the df command or maybe the find command and a bunch of other silly things. It doesn't have a whole lot to it, but it's the base baseline for a lot of little scripts that you can write. Um, here's some, and again, this is just kind of random conglomerate of stuff that I think that people might find interesting to get your brain going or get my brain going on something else. Um, we got some WMIC foo here. Um, I ran into where I had access to like 
over three or 400 machines, but I couldn't escalate my privileges, so I needed some way to quickly dump and find other users within those compromised systems. So I just wrote a really ugly script here to get the IPs that I had access to. Of course, they all had the same password and username, right? And we went through and looked for anything that had the word exe or the ex dot executable. And it would also show the, get the owner of that. So what I would do is get out the, the ones that were all duplicates or like a local administrator. And I'm basically, from that point, you're looking for you know, domain administrators or any other user besides local admin or what it, can't, what it ran as. Um, here's something I found online that uh, will list, it's almost like a net stat, but a Linux net stat, but for Windows. And this is all using WMIC. Um, here's some more foo. Um, this is part of the script on my site that basically escalates itself as system, and then it will kill any task that that the parent came from. So it, it used to start out like that, but actually now it has a white list of applications and then it kills everything else. So this is good for if you're on a computer and somebody's complaining about their, you know, it's a slow. You just go on there, run, run this, and it'll kill anything that's not within this limitation here. Um, here's where we're using PS exec to escalate system. And this is, can all be done probably without executables and things like that. but. Um, here's some more stuff that's actually where it's actually killing the the tasks that aren't in this whitelist. Um, and this is kind of jumping around randomly because I have ADD. We have a VNC repeater, so I don't know if you, if any of you, have any of you used like TeamSpeak or any free base solution providers that will do remote desktop, like go to my PC and all that, that bloatware basically. Um, you're actually using their, what I would say, gateway servers, which is this bit in the middle of the internet. And you don't know what they're doing with your data, even, even though they say it's secure. I mean, you can probably provide your own keys if you pay, something of that nature. But this is the setup where you run a reverse VNC server. This is what the person you want to control runs. And it shoots out to a server that just listens for remote uh, VNC access. And then you can control this server or this computer, whoever you want to control from any VNC client connecting to this guy. So, for example, you'll have somebody run this executable, quick VNC, that'll run this executable and it'll remote into any box using a phone or anything like that. Small, lightweight, I think the main binary is, the ultra VNC repeater binary is like, the single click is like 600K or something like that. Um, here's some examples, some stuff that you have to do for to keep the, per, the connection persistent, um, okay, arrow disable, automatic reconnect, we got some branding in there that'll do things like change the Internet Explorer name. And this is a squirrely little thing. I usually, I used to use Netstat, but I had issues with, for whatever reason, sometimes it wouldn't display that there was a connection established. So what we're doing here is we're saying, show me the TCP connections that had the name when VNC, and look for the word, ist I'm, I'm shorthanding there, but it's supposed to be established. So, and then once, if it's not there, then we want to restart. Um, also, we're not doing any encryption or anything. We have a random ID here. See how fast I'm moving. Is this we have a, through, uh, UAC problems? Um, this is not really UAC. Um, what, wait, wait, what, what's UAC again? So the client gets that, put it on, please type in an administrator and BNC fits itself. Right. The, what this is, is it's its own, um, it, it doesn't necessarily require UAC. If UAC is enabled, if you do any admin things for the lack of a better term, it will, you'll actually lose focus of the application. So for example, if you VNC into a box that has Windows 7 and UAC enabled, when you click the control panel, you lose focus, you lose input, you lose everything. Um, what you have to actually do is, once you access the box, run it again as administrator, and then you get all the bells and whistles, whatever you want to do. It's part of Windows 7, just a type of deal. So I got a randomly generated ID here, and here's an example of what you would set inside of the, the client, and that client has to set up B, support a proxy repeater. So you'll have a you know outside line here, and then here's whatever ID comes in through the VNC repeater. 
Um, if anybody has any questions, you can come back and meet me or just raise a hand or something like that. Let's see if I miss any of my questions here. I don't think so. Um, here is an example of someone quite some time ago just arbitrarily ran my remote desktop client. I was actually remoted into someone else's machine at the time, which you can't tell exactly who that is. But I was remoted into someone else's machine at the time, and all of a sudden the, the gateway agent that listens for connections, which actually Google will come in and sometimes just randomly connect to your VNC client like, a, like it's a web page or something, trying to index it. But I got another hit, and I'm like, who, who the hell is this You know, trying to connect to the uh, listener? Um, so I'm like, oh, whatever, I'll fire up another client and see who's trying to, you know, get a remote desktop. So I'll fire it up and then I see, you know, this this desktop here and it's got like, you know, some boot kits and some cool hacker stuff in here. And then he like brings up like a WinPCAP type of deal, like he's trying to figure out what's going on. And I bring up the chat and I actually bring up the chat. I'm like, hey, you know, you can just reboot your computer and it'll go away because since I had the persistent reconnect check in there in the background, it's constantly reconnecting and if he unplugs or kills the task or whatever, it just, just got a hidden command CMP executable that runs in a bad, stupid batch loop. So, you know, he's playing around and futzing around, I'm trying to communicate with him and then, of course, the last thing I see is him click the disconnect button from the internet. So, um, I, don't, I don't really watch it that much anymore because it's not, I don't leave it persistently, the, the repeater running because it's, you know, security risk because it's not running everything as root just like everybody else. Um, but that's kind of an interesting little little bit there. Here's some OCL foo. I tried to ask the guys in the channel for some kind of automated intelligent cracker script. So the problem with OCL hashcat, is anybody not familiar with OCL hashcat or any kind of hash cracking or anything like that? So basically briefly what it is, is it uses GPU processing to crack hashes. There's a couple of, before OCL, the open source uh, came out, there was one that was called like an extreme brute forcer, and it was the only one that it, it supported a Unix hash at the time. So it was like 30 bucks or $100 or something like that. And I used it to try and crack some hashes um, with little success. But as this developed and supported more different types of hashes, it's become the go-to for any type of cracking that I'll do run across. You know, you'll run across your NTLM hashes or some other kind of random thing, group of text that I can't figure out. I have to get somebody else to tell me exactly what type of encryption it is. But the, the, main, the main problem I had was, right, I had this hash and I needed it to be cracked, but what's the process? Do I go, you know, two characters and then three characters and then change to special characters, or do I just do like really long numbers and then start going down? From the, so what's the process from easiest, fastest cracking to to hardest, you know, brute force, 255 characters over a thousand years? So I ran into their forums. If you actually look online for batch crack and OCL hashcat, you'll find this script that I basically modified to do rules also automatically. So what it does is it'll load up uh, whatever hash, it's got a little menu in here. I'll show if I can, I don't think I can actually show it. <laughs> but it has a menu that tells you exactly which types of encryption that you want to select from. Let's see if I can bring that. Ooh, that's correct. Can you see Windows? Yay! So here's the mess of system configuration. Here's the different support, different hash algorithms it supports. So it's got a little cute little menu that I had it say, okay, all I had to do is look at the plain text and figure out which which one I need to type as the hash mode. And there's some basic settings inside of here that explain which one you want to do first. Um, there's a 40, 40 gig word list or dictionary file on the internet. If you look for the got milk, it's all spelled funny with a zero. There's a 40 gig word list online that you can download for free essentially if you want to wait forever. But uh, it's one of, from one of those downloader websites. But um, it'll go through a dictionary list 
what you want, and then these masking attacks, combinator attacks, and what I added was a rule-based attack. Because a lot of times, you'll see guys, once you compromise one system and get that hash, or get the password, plain text password, you'll see these guys use lead speed. Of course, all the admins use lead speed. You know, the dollar sign is an S and substitution for strings. Um, the, my previous employer, two employers ago, I was actually able to generate our password from a, a very small dictionary file, which that's not very good. But which I later copied and pasted somewhere on the internet and quickly changed our <laughs> firewall passwords. But um, that's just a quick little rundown of random. And here's where it's doing kind of some substitution and, and kind of easiest, hardest. Uh, yeah, it's actually, uh, it was an SH script that I had to hack up to the work. How come question marks aren't getting interpolated? Um, so the, these, these are saying, okay, run the cracking program and use these specific masks. So what it starts out as is it says um, that is a le lowercase letter, digit, 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 I think. Um, I haven't actually bothered to figure out how how to actually properly do it manually because I'm lazy, and I found scripts like this. Um, like here's everything, almost everything except symbol, I think. Um, but that's that's quickly some example do. Anyways, um, here's some a breakdown of a quick clean script. What I found a lot of times is I, I'll need in a hurry quick fast, I'll need disk space on a Windows machine. And also I ran into where I wanted to securely delete temporary files easily. Uh, what I ran across was is systems of multiple users. Everybody, use, anybody ever use uh, CC Cleaner before? Yes. For Windows? Yeah. <laughs> CC Cleaner, awesome. Except for it didn't delete the file securely and it only supported the current user you were logged in. They've since then added support for secure deletions, but you have to go into the options and you don't have to create yourself. So went through and this was before CC Cleaner, went through and kind of made this script to delete, you know, the temp folder, temporary Internet Explorer, uh, temp files for all users, uh, Firefox cookies, save passwords for all users, temp folders uh, in general for all users, the old Windows updates, recycle bin, um, and uninstall files within Windows that may or may not be needed. Um, and then we have kind of all startup items. So for example, you know, those people that have the, the lower right next to the time, and they have like 15 bars in the icon, it'll get rid of a fair chunk of those. Um, and that's where the quick kill will come in. If someone's having issues running a program, I'm like, quick kill, and then run the program. Oh, look, it runs fine. It's one of these 15,000 other executables you're running that's causing whatever problem you're having. Um, and here's, the, after that, after the optional startup items, we do all mailboxes and all users, everything inside of the local settings folder, which is really bad in most cases. But you'll get lots of space back sometimes. Uh, Who needs PSDs? What's that? Who needs PSDs? Sometimes. Um, well, what, what happened is, I actually gave this to my father because he said he was having disk space issues. I'm like, yeah, I just want this quickly real quick. Yeah, it freed up like 11 gigs. I'm like, well, what did it actually delete? Well, I don't know. Don't worry about it. You don't need any of that stuff. Um, I actually had the uninstall folder, the system root uninstall folder. I had it delete that and free up a fair amount of space. But at the time, Windows Office would keep the icon files for whatever reason inside of the uninstall folder. So when people would reboot, all their Office icons were broken. I, I don't know why they put them in the uninstalled folder. It's a feature! <laughs> it's a feature. <laughs> like, why, why are my office stuff? It's, it's not missing my office I can't do missing. Like, I don't know what you're talking it's about. Customized. Uh, uh, luckily, I don't have to do tech support all that often, except for friends and family, which, which is, yeah. I'd rather them come to me than go pay some Yahoo a bunch of money to just re-image their box. So, I think we're doing halfway there, so we're good. So here's kind of moving on to some web 
fun, for the lack of a better term. Um, so what I find is people are starting to, I don't know, in the past, what, say 15 years, are starting to hide their code. Back in the day, you could use just a regular web page ripper and say minus R, W get, and download the whole website, right? Well, now we get people trying to do stupid, sh like obfuscate inside of a job of, inside of JavaScript, or you know, use some stupid Flash plugin, right? Uh, we'll get like you know the, the video players. Everybody likes the new way YouTube loads videos. Have you noticed that the way the slider works, it like loads chunks at a time. It's really obnoxious. Um, there's a thing called TubeMate, which will automatically download whatever, for Android at least, will download uh, YouTube videos. So I use TubeMate instead of YouTube Player because YouTube just drives me nuts because it won't download the whole video. It only downloads to a buffer and then stops. So, um, you know, little things like that bother me. Um, they'll do things like refer checking, which means, I don't know if anybody's familiar with that, it's on the internet when you're using a browser, generally what will happen is when you click a link and go to the next page, you will receive a message or send a message to the server saying, hey, I was coming from this web server and this address and you know, let me in or allow this file to be downloaded. So sometimes you'll come into the, to the situation where Excuse me. You get to a web page and you download it, and then for whatever reason it's blank or gives you like a redirect or something. And you're like, why? Why with the browser it works, and with this you know command line interface it doesn't work. So you start looking at things like refer checking. Some of them will also even do agent tag check, check an agent tag and make sure it's actually a string and not curl or wget. And natively, anytime you use a command line agent, they'll default to their name as the, the agent and be disallowed. Um, what I do actually on my website is I block a lot of agent tags. I also block everything but Google that's not a string. And then anytime you request something on my server that's not there, I redirect you back to yourself. So there, with the thing within, um, Real quickly, a thing within called mod rewrite within Apache. You can, when someone requests something that's not there, a 404 or a file, um, if you've ever seen 404 errors um, of a page that's not there, if someone requests something that's not there, then I'll actually forward them back to their self. So what the remote server sees is, you know, you have these systems that are compromised. Your servers are constantly being attacked by other people if it's a web server. So what ends up happening is the person on the other side that has a compromised box, they're gonna see all these local requests to like some vulnerability or some PHP script or something like that. So we'll see like, you know, one.php or root shell.php. And what happens if it's not there on my server, I'll redirect them back to their self with the same entire link that, that they had. And they'll see a bunch of local Stuff. Oh, why am, why am I getting all these get requests for stuff that on my server that's not even there? So hopefully that'll help people identify why their servers are being compromised. That's the idea, just to mess with people. Um, I've actually had to go squirrely for whatever reason. Um, they will also get session tokens. Thing, things that use session tokens in, a, in web are a um, good example is things like Facebook. So for every page you request, unless you're using their API stuff, for every page you request, you get a session token. And you have to pass that session token to the next page you request, or you'll not get whatever you're trying to download. Um, I don't know why they do that. Maybe for, I'm not sure exactly, just for security reasons, I don't know. Um, but you also have authentication tokens, but session tokens are, in general, I say sessions, I mean, it's like a unique token every time you visit the site. So sometimes when you're doing some command line foo, you gotta grab that session token and pass it on to the next page that you load to get it to, to, eat, some, to, eat, to eat whatever you want. Um, we also have like mobile apps with pinning SSL search. Um, 
Does anybody know Rezu? This is a question for some free awesomeness. Um, what does anybody does anybody know what I mean by pinning SSL certs for mobile applications? SSL pinning? No. Um, so within mobile applications, generally speaking, at least with Android, what people will do is when you write an application with SSL, that doesn't matter. You can feed it a fake certificate that says this certificate is trusted for this application. Go on about your business and then you can actually man in the middle that traffic and do whatever you want to with it. Now what you're seeing nowadays is these stupid application developers are able to bundle in this certificate uh, authentication check within the application. So if you try to do a man in the middle attack and break the SSL certificate or give it a, a fake one, it'll say no or not even load right because it knows that, that the SSL certificate is like attached to the application. And then you can get on about, you have to do really smart stuff like decompile Android, which I'm not even gonna try it again. Um, tools for kind of reproducing traffic or sniffing traffic within webs. Um, we have command line scripts for Java, Spider Monkey will kind of, in most cases, you have to massage the data a little bit, but Spider Monkey will run Java for you within a command line interface. And this helps with people that try to obfuscate their code inside of Java. We have kind of browser plugins in general. If you haven't played with any of these, um, they're great. Uh, live HTTP headers, URL snooper, it's not a browser plugin, that's a different application entirely. It grabs URLs that have data or uh, binary data, metadata, um, me media, and it'll actually pull URLs out of a link. So if you want to figure out the direct link to something, you can use something like URL snooper and it'll just dump all the URLs that get loaded within whatever application you're using. Um, Wireshark is basically kind of like uh, that's kind of how URL snooper work. It's like Wireshark, but it, Wireshark, but it strips out all the URLs in your whatever session or whatever application you're using. Of course, Burp Suite, which is a really cheap web-based or Java-based man-in-the-middle tool for assessing web applications. And of course, proxy chains. Does anybody know how proxy chains works? Um, for a for a free piece of garbage. Proxy chains? Nobody's messed with proxy chains before? Man. Sorcery. Huh? Sorcery. Sorcery? Yeah. <laughs> um, proxy chains is awesome. What's even more awesome is that there's a Windows version called Proxifier. Um, if you haven't messed with proxy chains or Proxifier, write it down and go play with it. Uh, proxy chains will will run an applic any TCP based application will run through a specified list of proxies. And you can also chain them together if that proxy supports it. So for example, if you're on one of those stupid downloader websites and they're like, you've reached the maximum amount of times you can download for today. Well, if you use a, something like proxy chains and clear your cookies, you can download as many times as you want over and over again. Um, I've gotten up to one megabit down from free po proxies using proxy chains and a swarm-based downloader. So generally speaking, proxies, free proxies, for lack of a better term, are slow. Um, they're all out of China and they all sniff your traffic and take all your passwords, but um, y y they're just slow. So what proxy chains can do, you can run proxy chains, in Firefox, so all your, all your browsing goes through this specific list of proxies and then you can use a swarm-based downloader, like download the mall or any number of plugins for, for Firefox that will download one file with many chunks. So you'll have, say you have 200 proxies, you load up, download the mall, and you tell, open up tw 200 threads or open up 150 threads. Da -da 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 -da. It's actually downloading from, most of the time, a random proxy from that list a bit of that file, and then you're, instead of downloading it 2K, you're downloading it like a meg. Um, that's kind of interesting, fun to play around with. Um, and again, Proxyfire is a f 
paid version, sort of, of proxy chains. Proxyfire will listen, once you launch it, it will listen for any application and kind of man in the middle it and force any TCP connections you have going through it. It will force it out through, through, through Proxyfire or whatever proxy you specify. Now this is good for any time you have an application that doesn't support proxies. You, you know, for what, whatever application it is, it's a network-based application and you want to proxy it, Proxyfire will do it for you and proxy chains will also <coughs> do it for you. Um, there's a lot of articles online about proxy chains and using nmap through proxy chains. So you can have a list of proxy servers and actually scan a box from the internet from 50 different IPs using proxy chains. And that's the idea to get around intrusion detection saying, okay, well, this one specific host on the internet is scanning me really quickly. Instead, you break it up into your hosts and the server doesn't really know the difference um, depending on what your end settings are. Uh, yeah, I've done this interactively, PHP with curl. Curl is basically like wget, a command line uh, web-based tool. It's a, it extends a little bit more than wget. Um, you can do things like cookies, process cookies, and write cookies, and read cookies, and do all kinds of fun stuff. But sometimes you'll run into the time where you have to actually render a page um, and that's where PHP comes into play. Um, for example, I had some scripts running through for Sprint that showed the usage, data usage or something like that. And I just gave up trying to do it automatically and I had a PHP curl script that would go grab a page, render it, grab another page, render it, and for whatever reason that, that seemed to work. Um, and then just... Um, for doing command line sniffing or reproducing traffic that that you want to re replay. The, the whole idea is ripping something or changing the data within whatever application or web application you want to do. Um, for Flash stuff, we have Replay Media Catcher, which is um, really good for downloading videos from the internet that use those stupid players. Uh, if you open up Replay Media Catcher, you can actually add your own meta types. So if you want to download all text files, you can add meta type for text files, and it'll download all, all the text files you come across while you're browsing. Um, things like Hulu or any of those other secure streaming protocols, for, for lack of a better term, won't really get picked up by Replay Media Capture, but you'd be surprised which ones it works for. It's a commercial tool. Um, and then SWF decompiler is for Flash, decompiling Flash and kind of getting the plain text out of what that Flash application is doing. Um, Virtuous 10 Studio is really cheap. It's for Android decompiling and really easy. Idiot proof, Android reverse engineering or compile, decompile. I think it's like 50 bucks, something like that. What all you do is you plug it in to your phone you select what application you want to decompile, decompiles it for you, shows you the source, do what it, make whatever changes you want to make, hit the send button and it builds it for you and then you're running your application that crashes of course 90% of the time. Uh, here's some examples of JavaScript uh, in the command line. Uh, and a lot of this is of course ugly, but it gets the job done. Uh, here, here's kind of a proxy list server that blocks you or will obfuscate, is, is obfuscating the, the data that you get with Java. And that's a Java command that says document write. So basically what I'm doing here is this guy is trying to obfuscate his, the, his proxy list. He doesn't want people ripping his proxy list from off the internet. He says, all right, well, I'll encode it inside of Java so that you have to render the page, right? Well, you don't because you have a command line JavaScript. And that's where SpiderMonkey comes in here, JS at the end. But what we're doing here is we're using curl to download a, a URL. And then we're saying the agent tag is whatever. Um, then we got document write, which we're replacing document write with print because JavaScript doesn't have a function that's called document write. And we're basically processing this Java 
as and, and spitting out the plain text results. Um, here's another one where we had refer checking, which actually the site changed the way they do it. They do a combination now of JavaScript and refer checking and some image checking. Well, I haven't fixed it yet, but this is an example of a refer, uh, setting a refer to the page you want to render. So what will happen is sometimes you'll try to download a, a, a page or a, a file with a command line and you'll get either a blank or you'll get blank page or you'll get a default page or like a redirect to somewhere else. They're doing one of these, there's only so many things that they can do to prevent you from downloading the data with a command line tool. And one of the, one of the ways is through uh, refer checking. So um, that's a quick and dirty example of here we got cookies. He also was using cookies to prevent people from downloading the proxy list there. Um, here's a Google image ripping sort of script. Um, what I wanted years ago was, you know, er, you know, he's, you have an idea of someone you want to see a picture of, you know, like um, Angelina Jolie. Oh, I want my desktop to be Angelina Jolie. So what you do is you type in Google Images and you filter based on, you know, the size of the image because you don't want a crappy picture. You want high quality images. And then you have to look through and see which one you want or whatever. Well, well there's a script that would automatically do this for me. And it feeds a list of first and last name. And then it'll crawl through the number of results up to like 200. Um, so the idea here was <laughs> to just have a page that would say like a link that said like angelinejolie.html. You click that page, that link, and it gives you the first like 200 images or so of Angelina Jolie and just loads them in one page. And you'll see this on a browser if you load any of the, the gal uh, examples. You'll see like the process usage for Firefox just like pfft, go crazy eyed. Um, but that's, this is an example of more curl through uh, put this inside of a loop and, you know, count to the next page. This is what page it says. This is the first and last name. Um, I'll just kind of actually show you an example here. I'm on the tubes. And this is something I keep getting, uh, they keep trying to sue me for. Um, I had female celebs, busty Asians, and... I added male celebs for my wife, Kathy, because she's like, why don't you have guys on there? I'm like, okay. So what this essentially does is it grabs the first, like, first 200 or so images or first 200 pages of a Google image result. And, of course, it doesn't have the safe search off because we have the... We don't want to... We don't want to... We want all our non-filtered safe off. We want all our nudies to be in there when we do this. But when I started playing around with it, uh, it sat up here for a while, and then it got indexed, and now it's pretty much the only thing that hits my website besides Google. Um, so you'll get a lot of uh, requests come through. And I don't, I'm hoping none of these are I'm trying to find somebody like not, that wouldn't have nudes. I don't even know of any of these people. But what's that? <laughs> Where do we see that? <laughs> yeah, so it's loading all these images at once, and it just eventually will crash any ba CPU-based thing. So it's it's kind of interesting because what will happen is these automated scripts go out on the Internet, and they scan for copyrighted images, and you'll get something like, I eh, can't see what I'm typing. Where am I? Time wise, not uh, close enough. Oh, did I type it right? Did I type it right? No. Nope. Oh, I got redirected back to myself. That's an example of if you type in a URL wrong to my website, you get redirected back to yourself. And that's T Mobile's, I guess, T Mobile's website. I don't know. And some people will be trying to do remote support, and they'll type in my URL wrong, and they'll be like, oh, it says username and password. 
because they typed in the username, they typed in the URL wrong, it forwards them back to their self, which forwards them back to their router, which of course their router, when they log into the router, it's going to ask you for your username and password. So if somebody goes to my website and they're like, oh, it's asking for username and password. I'm like, well, you typed in a, link, a portion of the link wrong because they're getting forwarded back to your own router. And of course, I try to explain that to them and I just give up. So I just say, you typed it wrong. Um, I want to say it's in one of these newer ones. AMD, let me move this over, I can't see. Does anybody have any questions about the random amounts of data that I'm throwing at them? Well, when can we expect full impl uh, implementation of your Tumblr clone? <laughs> Tumblr clone, nice. Yeah, well, the, the idea is, um, I actually got listed on one of those. I had sex terms, I, I compiled a list of, of common sex terms um, and to convert it into a text file, and it got put on Tumblr, and my poor Comcast connection, like, almost died. Like, like every second, it was just like, boom, boom, boom. And luckily, it was just a text file and didn't, like, have a bunch of just garbage on it. Uncommon. Yeah, yeah, uncommon. Oh, here we go. So this is the notice that I got from it's like anti-piracy something, copyrightenforcement.com or something. Um, I keep getting these randomly, but this was the most the scariest one because uh, they're saying that, you know, I have all these images on my website. And this is the result of that Google image indexing all in one page that I showed you earlier. Um, notice at the bottom, I owe them $6,500. Um, and I quickly ignored that, which, this was back in June, uh, June the 19th, and I said, well, whatever, just delete, take it out of my inbox. I think I replied to one of them saying, these, Google, these are Google images. If you sue me, you probably want to sue Google first, and they have a lot more money than me. Um, I just kind of ignored it, but uh, last week or week before, I uh, got something from Amazon, and Amazon, these a, a, the copyright infringement guys, whoever these jokers are, um, they forward this off to Amazon, my provider, and they sent in a like a cease and desist type of remove these images from your website. And Amazon sent me three tickets saying, you know, oh, remove these, you know, or they, they said respond to this within 24 hours or we might shut your instance, your, your web server down. I was like, mother, whatever. So I'm, I'm actually got a, a friend that's somewhat of a lawyer um, to try and help me put a disclaimer up on there. so. Maybe it'll help fend off some of the uh, some of the random idiots that yeah send me stuff. But I've sent I've probably sent ten emails about this and how it works. That's where I get most of my hits. Actually, I don't know. Yeah, busty agents. It's mostly like it'll be like a random celebrity name every month. Like sometimes it'll be busty agent of the month. Busty agent of the month, actually. Uh, I do have, where are we at? Um, nope, it's not caps. Quickly, before I get redirected to myself. Um, let's see, where are we at? Is this September? Um, yeah, and actually, I block lots of bots. Like, 70% of any web server's traffic is bots, and I block them, and I still get tons of random bits. But we'll do a... Uh, oh, I also get people downloading my proxy list that are using it for uh, bad things. And I've gotten strange phone calls from people saying that they're trying to sue people, and I'm like, look, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not a lawyer. I can help you do whatever you want to do, but... They're trying to talk about suing level three. And I'm like, I mean, isn't that the internet? You can't sue the internet. <laughs> um, so here's some random, here's our top search screens. And maybe, there's not any in description. Oh, here's some, you're searching for videos. And it, I mean, it's all, I get this one, my proxy stuff. But the rest is, <laughs> is all of the Google images. 
that's where most of my searches comes from. But uh, yeah, it's just random, random stuff. Uh, let's see more tangents. Uh, here's some regex examples. Um, I'll run across when I'm doing pen penetration tests or vulnerability assessments. I'll run across a lot of times large amounts of data, um, like f open shares or NFS shares or insecure FTP servers. Or I'll run across large amounts of data, and the the ability to process and look for sensitive data within large amounts of data is key when you only have like two days to do this stupid pen test. So um, I rolled into something like this. Um, this is an example of how to find PII, which is personally identifiable information, um, within Office documents. What we're doing here is we're searching for credit card numbers and we're searching for social security numbers all in one line. So you can aim this command at a share inside of a Linux console or SIGWIN if you want to go that route. Um, you can aim this inside of uh, at any share or any mounted device and it will pull so credit card numbers and social security numbers out of it. I have no claim to this regex because that's just not me. But I, what I did is I combined them buying the credit card and social security number together. Um, notice, you know, DOCX, your office files end in an X. The only difference between, well, the new format, anything with the X, is actually just a zip file. So if you open up your Office document, you can open it up in WinZip, or God forbid you use WinZip. Uh, <laughs> if you open it up with 7-Zip, uh, which I would suggest, 7-Zip.org is a great uh, compression utility. Anyways, um, if you open it up inside of there, you can actually see the XML data inside of there. And that's what this is doing. It's unzipping the file on the fly, doing some other stuff, and catting it out and looking. It's actually removing the um, HTML tags in here, and we're removing some other stuff. And then here's where we're, the grep command is kind of like a find, a specific string. Um, we're replacing is what said is doing here. And we're looking for a particular string. And in here, we're looking for credit card number, social security numbers. So. Um, I've aimed this at places where I didn't think there would be personal information or social security numbers, and it's come back with HTML. I mean, social security numbers. But actually, it's 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 fairly steady. Um, you get to the point where it gets too large and it won't. It takes forever. Uh, here's some more example regex foo that I love to use during assessments. Um, most of these are on the internet. I didn't write any of these except this one's kind of a conglomerate. Um, so most of these are email, search for emails, um, search for internal IP addresses. This is great for if you're doing an assessment and you want to find some more space inside of there. They say, oh, well, you know, we're on any, anything on the, on the 172 network is all us and we don't have any servers anywhere else. There's, there's nothing here. Um, no, 90% of the time, if they give us a limited scope, or an unlimited scope and they tell us, oh, our space is here, I'll find some server somewhere. Um, not generally this tactic, but a different uh, script I have searches for routers, um, but that's something else entirely. Uh, here's IP address. It's kind of, inter it's the same thing as internal IP, but it, it grips for just an IP address. Um, here's a UNC path. Um, if anybody knows, it's like backslash backslash and then a computer name and then possibly a folder name or file name. Uh, this is good. I'll look for this inside of source code because a lot of times people will grab stuff inside of source code and use it for whatever and I'll be able to open the share or see, have credentials possibly to this. Um, I'm trying to work on a search for passwords feature. Um, all of these regexes I use with a program called PowerGrep. PowerGrep is a not free program to search inside of documents for regex for data. Um, it'll actually open up, has anybody used uh, spy, or Spider Cornell Labs or Cornell Labs Spider? It's for searching for PII and it does a horrible job. So I use PowerGrep now to 
to use these to search for strings and sensitive data and things like that, the word password. Um, but this is supposed to be search for the, it's supposed to search for a password and it doesn't really work most of the time. I end up getting HTML back because there's a lot of funky characters in HTML, right? So if you aim this regex at a folder, it just starts dumping HTML. You're like, no, I, don't want, I want passwords. So I'm, I'm working on this to limit it some way to not show HTML, um, but I haven't quite figured it out. Um, here's some random foo annoyances that I wanted into. Uh, command line uh, regex or command line registry. Um, if you want to add a tag to the command line or add an option to the command line, this is how to disable the stupid ass.com crap when you install Java. You run these two commands and you won't get the annoying nag for anything free in Windows. Apparently has a search bar in it now. I don't know when that happened, but it creeped up on me. <laughs> Here's uh, what I use in my portable. Uh, I have a folder that's called USB and it has everything I need on it. So I can roll it to a machine, plug in a USB stick or download whatever it is off the internet and have all the stuff I need to do anything uh, within Windows at least. Um, but this is how to associate, change your file associations with the command prompt. Uh, a lot of times you'll have some application that hijacks your file associations for whatever reason. Um, that's a, an example of that. Um, if anybody, has anybody ever used Mimikatz or um, Windows Credential Editor? Mimikatz, Windows Credential Editor. Uh, the Windows Credential Editor has been around for a while. But when Mimikaz came out, I discovered Windows Credential Editor. So what this does is it dumps the plain text password of the Windows current, or it, if you have administrative rights, it actually dumps the plain text passwords of anything that's running and or logged in is the idea. Um, if you haven't checked out Windows Credential Editor, run it because it's really cool. It will dump your plain text password instantly. So you'll get people, people will email me at uh, KPMG. They'll email me, oh, I need you to crack this hash. I was like, well, do you have access to the box? Well, yeah, well, I've rooted like four boxes. Okay, well, run these two tools and you'll get the password. There's no need to crack any hashes. And also you can dump the hashes out and pass the hashes straight on to somewhere else without even needing the plain text. But uh, these are great tools. If you haven't messed with them, I would uh, Google Windows Credential Editor and play with it because it's... Awesome. Um, use it a lot. Um, here's some other random scripts. We got um, NMAP MSO67 scanner that does a better job of checking than Nessus, which is a commercial vulnerability scanner. Um, I ran this on a s selected uh, ho list of hosts, and I got like something like s 20 or 30 uh, vulnerabilities back. And when I ran Nessus, it came back with like eight. Um, something that this does that's not, that's more intrusive than what Nessus does. And I'll get a lot more hits if I'm looking for this specific vulnerability with, within map. Uh, um, it's all included within nmap. It's part of nmap base NSC script. Um, there's some other cool stuff inside of their SVN repository for whatever reason they don't put anything, they, they don't put some of their scripts inside of the, the, the main binaries. But uh, this is a quick check to search for MS-067. Um, worst case scenario, the server, uh, <laughs> the server application will crap out and die and either will crash or what I've seen, it'll just restart itself and it won't cause any problems. Um, I've been running this for ever since I knew about it and discovered that it was better than Nessus for a while. Um, it's kind of like a really quick way to find uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, here's an example of changing your uh, power profile via command line. I never run as administrator in Windows. For whatever reason, I do it in Unix all the time, in Linux. But Windows, I never run as admin because I run lots of, I click lots of stuff. Uh, so uh, what, I'll, what I'll have is the problem I want. Sometimes I'll want, uh, I want to change the power profile and there's no way to that I could find to do that within Windows without having admin and instead of logging in and switching users you can do that uh, through this way. Um, here's another stored credentials. Um, if you haven't run this command on your computer 
and you talk to other computers and authenticate to other Windows computers, um, I would run this command and see what you get back. You'll be interested to know that there's probably a lot of stuff in here that you probably wouldn't want in here. This is kind of like Macintosh's uh, key store, sort of. I don't know if it actually, yeah, probably encrypts it at some point in time, but it's, it'll, it'll show all the, uh, the saved credentials. Anytime you log into something and you click that save this password, that's where this, this guy goes. So you can clean that out and make it nice and secure um, for when you're doing assessments. Um, here's a, another example I tried to do um, VMware or um, Metasploit for checking Oracle and I ended up with using Nmap because it's a thousand times easier. Uh, these two lines, first one is to look for a SID, which is a, within Oracle, it's not just the username and password you need to log in a database. You need an instance name. And what this script does is it guesses for a set of instance names or SIDs. And you provide a target here and we'll give you results. And then once you get a SID, for example, in this, we have the XE SID, which is a common instance or SID name within, uh, within Oracle. And then this will try to brute force the usernames and default logins that come with a lot of them, like sys sys or anything like that. Um, here's the example of a, that's not spelled right. I think, it, yeah, it's auto high key. Um, if any of you played Star Wars Old Republic, I made a completely automated grind script that was written in auto hotkey because I don't know how to program or reverse engineer anything. So there's a really cool feature within auto hotkey. You can do a thing called pixel search and you can search for a specific color within the display. So what I do is I search for like red and then if it's red, then attack. And if it's yellow, then walk around, stumble, try to stumble into some enemies. Um, but that was kind of interesting script. I'd wake up and of course I'd be dead, but it's kind of interesting. Um, some other thoughts here. Uh, make it portable. There's a thing called SFX, a self-extracting executable, where you can zip something up using WinRAR or something like that. You can zip something up and make it uh, portable and one single executable to do all your bidding. Um, QEMU, uh, micro XP, there's a 200 meg zip file that will actually, uh, 200 meg zip file that will run QEMU, which is a virtualization sort of platform. And if you s look Google for micro XP, you'll get um, uh, file catchers portable has a single load image that you can load up. If you don't have administrative rights and you can run an executable, you can get uh, to run, you can run your own tiny little virtual machine inside of it. So I've ac had assessments where I've had access to a system and they say, oh, well, you can't install any software. You can't do anything, blah, blah, blah. And well, if you don't have white listed binaries enabled, and I can run any executable I want. What I'm going to do is I'm going to run this micro XP and do whatever the hell I want to. I can install my VPN software. What was that? Sometimes that works, um, but with your super fancy uh, white listed binary application programs, like I can't remember the names of some of them, but they won't let you run anything. You change the name, you change the coding a little bit, and it, it still somehow it magically knows that that binary is still not the original binary, maybe a hash check or something like that. Um, use a real real language and you know, not my ugly scripts. Um, there's some applications of virtualization. Uh, raise your hand if anybody can tell me for one of these garbage prizes, which one of these is a free virtualization application program? Free as in not commercially uh, that's commercial available. Yes, but that's with limited options. Um, it's not a clear question. You can download a trial of 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 ThinApp, but um, yeah. Well, uh, the this one's the one that's kind of open source. You did? Yeah. Go ahead. Grab whatever. Pixel. You don't want to pix Cisco pix. This is a really good P2. It works. Hard drive is great. Yeah, here, grab whatever you want. I don't know. It's got cool stickers on the back. You can open this up and look really cool. Yeah, you can, you can, you can have that. Oh, here's the power adapter. You need the power, man. You need the power adapter. You got to have that. <laughs> um, this is the second to last slide. This is QEMU running with my 200 meg. Um, this is the original, the host machine, the parent, 
machine in, out here. And here's the QEMU image running inside of here. And I've got an IP address, a NAT IP address, and I can do whatever the hell I want inside of here. And this, this host machine doesn't know what I'm doing at all. Um, yeah, it's got little cats. So um, here's some references in here. There's a foo text that I have that I collected that's just, just random bits of stuff. And when somebody asks me a question, like, how do I do this? I'm like, eh, look at the foo. It's in there somewhere. Um, here's a ripped of commandlinefoo.com. I ripped all the important stuff out of this website and dumped it into one giant text file if I need examples of curl or whatever. Um, and then here's some examples used in the, the presentation. Um, pretty much anything under the scripts folder is fun to play with. Um, here's the proxy check script that does, that talks about refer checking and things to obfuscate the uh, downloading applications. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's got uh, some of it is is for lack of a better word pirated content, but most of it is uh is stuff that I wrote in the download folder. Anything with quick in the first the prefix is little scripts that I wrote. Quick cleaner, quick VNC, and quick kill are all really cool applications to play around with. So, uh, anybody have any questions? Anything about this random amounts of data I threw at you? Yes, um, I'll give you one of my stickers. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I tried. I thought about drinking before I got here, but that's still early. Still early, but. Uh, all right. I appreciate your time and go do some cool stuff.